Thus says Yehovah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yehovah of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Hear us, O Lord, when we call. O Lord God of hosts, turn us back again. And cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord, hear the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But with thee there is forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Amen. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, help us always remember that Thou art King of kings and Lord of lords. Thou art called faithful and true, and in justice Thou dost judge and make war. We pray that we may follow Thee wherever Thou dost lead us. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so on the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Keep us in thy name, O Lord. Glory be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. recitation is number 139. It comes from Arcana Celestia 6821. He who loves his country and from good will does good to it, in the other life loves the Lord's kingdom. For there the Lord's kingdom is his country. And he who loves the Lord's kingdom loves the Lord because the Lord is the all in all of his kingdom. Families with young children are welcome to come forward now.
there was a good king named Hezekiah. And he was the king of the Jews. He was the king of the land of Judea. And he lived in the city of Jerusalem. And he loved the Lord. So he went all through his country, the land of Judea. And he made sure that the people got rid of all the false gods that they were worshiping. And he taught them, no, throw them in the fire. The Lord, Yehovah, is the only true God that you must worship. So he was a very good king. But then along came the mighty nation of Assyria, the strongest nation in the world at that time. And the Assyrians came along and they conquered all the nations all around the land of Judea. And they conquered Judea, Hezekiah's country, too. And so all the people ran and they came into the city of Jerusalem with its walls to try to be safe from the Assyrians. And the Assyrian army was all around the city. They wouldn't let anybody go out or come in. And the Assyrians said to King Hezekiah, and they sent a letter to him, and then they shouted it to the people on the walls, Why are you trusting Yehovah to save you? Look at all the other nations we conquered. Their gods didn't save them. Why do you think Yehovah is going to save you? So it was very scary. And do you think that King Hezekiah gave up and surrendered? No. No, you're right. Instead, he prayed to the Lord, and here is what the Lord, the message the Lord gave him to send back to the Assyrians. Here's what the Lord said he should tell them. For, him, for the Lord. This is the Lord speaking to the Assyrians. Have you not heard how I have done it from afar off and formed it from the ancient days? Now I have made it come to pass. And it shall be that walled cities shall be destroyed into ruinous heaps. And the people who dwell in them short of hand were dismayed and ashamed they became as the herb of the field and the vegetable of the tender herb, the grass of the roofs, and the field scorched before the standing grain. The Lord is saying, I'm the one who made you conquer all those nations. But I know thy dwelling, you Assyrians, and thy going out and thy coming in and thy trembling towards me, because of thine arrogance, your boastfulness against me, and thine ease has come up into my ears, Therefore, I will set my hook in thy nose and my bit in thy lips, and I will cause thee to return by the way by which thou camest. Therefore, thus says Yehovah concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor shall he go before her with a shield, nor pour out an embankment against her. By the way that he came, by it he shall return. And to this city he shall not come, says Yehovah. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for David my servant's sake. And it was in that night that the angel of Yehovah went forth and smote in the camp of Assyria 185,000. And they got up early in the morning, and behold, all of them dead corpses. So here's a picture of the Assyrians conquering one of the other cities. You can see their mighty army. They're conquering that city. They're going to take, they're going to knock it down and take the people away. They made the people leave their homelands and march far away and they never came back. The ten tribes of Israel who live north of King Hezekiah, they all disappeared. We don't know what happened to them in history. And here is a picture of the Assyrian commander calling up to the men on the walls of the city and saying to them, Give up! You can't save yourself. None of these other people's gods saved them. You can't be saved. Just give up. That's what he's saying to them. But Hezekiah didn't listen to him, did he? So in the message that the Lord gave him, he said, I've put my bit in your lips. What kind of an animal has a bit in his lips? Do you know? What kind of animal do you put a metal bit in? Yes? That's the first one. That's the ring in his nose. Very good. That's right. And what kind? Yes? A horse? a horse? That's right. So let's talk about the ring or the hook in his nose. 
A bull is a very strong animal. It can be very fierce. That's like the nation of Assyria. And so what farmers do if they keep a bull is when the bull is little, they put an iron ring in his nose and they have a long pole with a hook on it. So if they hook that bull's nose ring, the bull can't do anything because his nose is very soft. So if he tries to jerk his head around or poke you with his horns, it hurts his nose like anything. So he has to do what the farmer wants him to and go where the farmer wants him to go. The Lord says, I'm the farmer. I'm putting my hook in your nose, Assyria. I'm going to take you back home where you came from. And he says, I'm the rider of you. You're a horse and I'm your rider. I have a bit in your mouth. So if you pull against that bit, it's going to hurt your mouth. You have to go where I'm telling you to go. And did you hear what the Lord did to save the, land, the city of Jerusalem? What did the Lord do? The angel of the Lord came in one night, and what did he do? Did you hear? Killed all the Assyrians. That's right. He killed 185,000 soldiers. So in the morning when the people of Jerusalem woke up, the Assyrian army was dead. So they were safe. And the rest of the Assyrians just went home. They were afraid now of Jehovah. Now, what we can learn from this story is oh, we... I didn't know that. Okay. Do, do you know what country we live in? Do we live in the nation of Assyria? No. Or Judea? No. What country do we live in? America. America, that's right. Now, America is a very strong country, but what makes America strong? Is it because we have lots of tanks and airplanes? Is it because we're very, very smart? Is it because we have big muscles? Is that what makes America strong? What makes America strong? Yes, and, and we're free because what? Yes? The Lord makes us free. That's right. And so here's the thing. The Lord made Assyria strong. He's the one who made them strong to sweep away all those false gods and throw them in the fire. They needed to get rid of them. But he's also the one who made King Hezekiah in Jerusalem even stronger than the Assyrians. So the Assyrians could not conquer them. And the Lord is the only one who can make America strong. But what do we need to do if we want America to be strong? Trust that trust in him and yeah. also be good. be good. That's right. Is that what you were going to say? We need to obey the Lord. We need to love the Lord with all our heart and soul and strength. Because if we obey the Lord with all our heart and soul and strength, then the Lord can keep us safe. and He will protect our country. If we don't follow him, then we'll be like Assyria and the Lord will put his hook in our nose and a bit in our teeth and take us away. But if we follow him, then we, the Lord can protect us and keep us strong. So we mustn't think that we're strong because of ourselves, but we know that the all strength comes from the Lord when we follow him with all our heart and soul and strength. Amen. Lord, give his angels a command concerning thee to keep thee safe in all thy ways. Amen.
Hear further from the word of the Lord in 2 Kings chapter 19. So Rabshakeh returned, and he sent messengers again unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph, and the children of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, of Hena and of Ewa? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of Jehovah and spread it before Jehovah. And Hezekiah prayed before Jehovah and said, O Jehovah, God of Israel, who dwells between the cherubim, thou art the God, thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Jehovah, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Jehovah, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, who hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Jehovah, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Jehovah our God, I beseech thee, Save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art Jehovah God, thou alone. We read also from the word of the Lord's second coming, Divine Providence number 251. The worshiper of himself and of nature confirms himself against the divine providence when he reflects that wars are permitted, and in them the slaughter of so many men and the plundering of their wealth. It is not from the divine providence that wars occur, because they involve murders, plunderings, violence, cruelties, and other terrible evils which are diametrically opposed to Christian charity. Still, they cannot but be permitted, because since the time of the most ancient people meant by Adam and his wife, Men's life's love has become such that it wills to rule over others, and finally over all, and also to possess the wealth of the world, and finally all wealth. These two loves cannot be kept in fetters, for it is according to the divine providence that everyone is allowed to act from freedom in accordance with reason. And without permissions, man cannot be led away from evil by the Lord, and consequently cannot be reformed and saved. For unless evils were allowed to break out, man would not see them, and therefore would not acknowledge them, and thus could not be induced to resist them. Hence it is that evils cannot be repressed by any act of providence, for if they were, they would remain shut in. And like a disease such as cancer and gangrene, they would spread and consume everything vital in man. There are many other reasons stored up in the treasury of divine wisdom why the greater wars with kings and rulers, involving as they do murders, plunderings, violence, and cruelties, are not prevented by the Lord, either in their beginning or in their progress, until in the end the power of one or the other has been so reduced that he is in danger of destruction. Some of these reasons have been revealed to me, and among them is this, that all wars, although they may be civil in character, represent in heaven states of the church and our correspondences. Such were all the wars described in the word, and such also are all wars at this day. The wars described in the word are those which the children of Israel waged with various nations, as with the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Philistines, the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, and the Assyrians. Moreover, when the children of Israel, who represented the church, 
departed from their precepts and statutes and fell into the evils which were represented by those nations. For each nation with which the children of Israel waged war signified some particular kind of evil. They were punished by that nation. For example, when they profaned the holy things of the church by foul idolatries, they were punished by the Assyrians and the Chaldeans, because Assyria and Chaldea signify the profanation of what is holy. Similar things are represented by the wars of the present day, wherever they occur. For all things which take place in the natural world correspond to spiritual things in the spiritual world, and all spiritual things have relation to the church. Moreover, the quality of the church on earth and what the evils are into which it falls and for which it is punished by wars cannot be seen at all in the natural world, because in this world only external things are manifest, and these do not constitute the church. However, this is seen in the spiritual world where internal things appear, and in these is the church itself. And there all people are conjoined according to their various states. The conflicts of these in the spiritual world correspond to wars, which on both sides are governed according to correspondence by the Lord in accordance with His divine providence. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.
words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be for good pleasure in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Now therefore, O Yehovah our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art Yehovah God, thou alone. With these words, King Hezekiah of Judah prayed to the Lord for the city Jerusalem. He was besieged by a huge Assyrian army, the mightiest military power in the world at that time. The Assyrians had conquered all the fertile crescent from Babylon to the borders of Egypt. They had taken the northern tribes of Israel from their homeland as captives, never to return. Jerusalem was like a little island in the Assyrian Sea of Conquest. The Jews had already been compelled to pay tribute. Now the Assyrians had come back to take them away into captivity. The Rabshakeh, the Assyrian commander taunted Hezekiah, Let not your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. He asked with compelling logic, Where were all the gods of the other nations and cities which the Assyrians had overrun? But Hezekiah, though fearful, still hoped the Lord would save them. He knew that those gods had been mere idols, the work of men's hands so they deserved to be cast into the fire. Now he begged the Lord to look down and save Jerusalem and prove that he was the true God over all the nations of the earth. The Lord's answer through the prophet Isaiah teaches us two great truths. First, the Lord governs the course of wars. Second, the outcome of a war has relation to the spiritual states of the nations involved. Assyria had indeed been appointed by the Lord to put an end to the perverted idolatries of many nations. But now Assyria itself was to be turned back because of its arrogance and rage against the Lord. Jerusalem would be saved because it was the home of a good king and his people, a representative of a true church. This week we observe Independence Day. We remember the principles of government by laws and civil liberty for which our forefathers pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Today, as always, there are wars in many parts of the globe. We are grateful for the wonderful peace in our land in which we have been privileged to live in this country since the end of the Civil War. The, war, the word comforts us in assuring that the Lord's providence governs the states of war and peace in the world and points to ways in which we can help keep our country free from the scourge of war. Among the truths from the treasury of divine wisdom now revealed is this, that all wars, not just the ones in the Old Testament, represent and correspond to the spiritual states of the church. Even wars that seem to be primarily territorial conflicts or civil wars without any religious issue in the minds of the combatants reflect the attacks of the evil spirits on the spiritual lives of those people and the angels labor to liberate them. Many people have recognized something of divine judgment in the ravages of war. In the midst of the civil war, the president wrote, if we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue 
until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn by, with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether." It is easy to see the correspondence with the states of the church in the Israelitish wars described in the word. The writings say that the children of Israel under Joshua and later under David were permitted to conquer Canaan and destroy its inhabitants, mainly to wipe out the corrupt remains of the ancient church existing there at that time. Those people practiced infant sacrifice and other abominable customs which the Lord commanded Israel to eradicate, lest they be drawn into these abominations themselves. Similarly, Islam was permitted to sweep the Near East and Northern Africa with fire and sword to get rid of terrible idolatrous customs that were making people spiritually and naturally sick. The peoples whom the Muslims conquered or converted had no stomach to resist because there was no spiritual or moral strength left in their culture. Many were glad to be given new religious leadership at that time. In their day, the children of Israel represented the true church, as long as they carefully followed the commandments and religious statutes which the Lord had given them through Moses. While they obeyed, they were blessed with victory and prosperity, corresponding with the peace of heaven. But when they disobeyed, their correspondence with heaven was broken, and they were then punished by the very nation that represented the evil into which they had fallen. For example, we read, when they profaned the holy things of the church by foul idolatries, they were punished by the Assyrians and the Chaldeans, because Assyria and Chaldea signify the profanation of what is holy. Although we cannot see the representations of modern nations, still we are taught similar things are represented by the wars of the present day, wherever they occur. It is not known in this world which kingdoms in Christendom represent the Moabites and Ammonites, the Syrians and Philistines, the Chaldeans and Assyrians, and the others with whom the children of Israel waged war. And yet there are peoples who represent them. The representations of various nations, ancient or modern, depend on the general spiritual character of their peoples. Each nation has its own special character, just as each man and woman has a unique face and mind. The spiritual state of a nation is the state of its people's actual worship of God by a moral life lived in obedience to God's commandments as they understand them. The writings indicate some of the special qualities of various nations at the time of the Last Judgment in 1757. They point out some of their spiritual strengths and weaknesses. They also indicate some of the external things on which each nation's spiritual strengths and weaknesses were based, especially the state of civil order and freedom and the influence of the organized churches. Since the spiritual states of people and nations have to do with their motives, not just their actions or membership in church organizations or professed beliefs, spiritual states cannot be observed in this world. Still, we can use the external characteristics pointed out by the heavenly doctrine to evaluate the health of our country and to correct obvious evils if we remember that our judgments are only outward, the Lord alone knows the hearts of all the children of men. In the spiritual world, where internal things become obvious, the spiritual states of peoples and nations are clear. So is the correspondence of their wars in the natural world with the spiritual warfare for their souls. All our thoughts and feelings relate to what is good and true, or evil and false thus to a healthy or a sick state of the church. So far as evil becomes predominant with a certain people, it tends to shape the policies of their nation, 
manifesting itself in various kinds of corruption and often in aggression against others within their borders or outside. In this respect, the lives of nations are no different from the lives of individuals. As the children of Israel were punished when they fell into evils, so a spiritually sick nation is more open to attack than one that is spiritually healthy. The Lord never wants wars to happen. He does not use war as a punishment or in any sense bring war upon people. He is love and mercy itself. We are the cause of wars when we allow ourselves to be ruled by the hells, just as people are the cause of their own judgments after death. The Lord cannot avoid permitting wars to take place at times, just as he must allow other lesser crimes. People must be allowed to act in freedom according to what makes sense to them. One good thing the Lord brings out of wars is that we see what human nature is like without the Lord. From birth, each person has a little hell inside, bent on warring against the Lord. But we have a hard time believing this, even though the word frequently tells us, if the Lord did not allow evil to break out into actual wickedness and war, with all its misery and grief, we would never see that without the Lord, we are in hell, and that hell is a terrible state. We would look only at our outwardly polite, moral lives, those of our nice friends, and the Lord could not lead us to resist evil inwardly. And if we could not do evil, we would not experience its pain. So the Lord could not lead us to want to be set free from it. For these reasons, the Lord must permit wars. Small-scale conflicts in homes and in workplaces, larger-scale wars within and between nations. Still, he governs them in every detail as they run their course. History is full of examples of battles won and lost due to unforeseen, unplanned circumstances. Since the Lord governs the tiniest details of even the most trivial parts of our lives down to the shuffling of cards and the rolling of dice, he certainly governs the events of war by which the lives of so many people are deeply affected. Working according to the free choices and efforts of human beings, he looks to the eternal welfare of every single person involved. We should pray that our country may be protected by the Lord from the horrors of war. If we love our country, we ourselves must fight against the loves of hell in our everyday life, such as covetousness and materialism, adultery and deceit, and the lust of dominating. These are the causes of war. To shun these evils is our first responsibility. We must shun them ourselves and raise our children to shun them as well. At the same time, we need to foster a proactive trust in the Lord and His providence. As citizens, let us help our country grow into a hospitable home for the Lord's kingdom. We would like our country to be known for moral and civil order, liberty and justice, and charity and discretion in dealing with other nations. As far as good people succeed in these efforts, the Lord will defend our country in war and peace just as he saved Jerusalem from the Assyrians. For the Lord protects those who are in the stream of his providence, whatever may be the appearance of the means. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people, from henceforth even forever. Amen. Now to the one only God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed be the name of God from ages and even for ages, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who know understanding. We pray that we may be good citizens of thy kingdom on earth, that the laws of our country and the administration of them may be carried out with justice by people who are skilled in the laws, wise and God-fearing, and that in this way, we may all be carried along in the stream of thy providence. Amen. Yes, I come quickly. Amen. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.